This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmoth. Florida is home to roughly 6,800 manatees, but just this year alone, more than 750 have died. That is 10% of the total population and the most deaths ever recorded in a five-month period. The root cause? Starvation, especially in the Indian River Lagoon, where a large die-off of seagrass has left the manatees without enough to eat. This morning, Patrick Rose, the executive director of Save the Manatee Club, is here to discuss the alarming statistics and what needs to happen to reverse course. The very unusual number of manatees that have died this year, it's unique because we've had hundreds of manatees actually literally starve to death. And really in the history of the manatee work and keeping track in the censuses and so forth, we've never had anything like this before. In fact, it was believed and we had the evidence that there should have been plenty of food for manatees, but man's actions have really caused a major decline in the seagrass available in the Indian River Lagoon. When you say man's actions, I mean, we, is this what, can you expand on that and and what the, the problem is there? Yeah, after really a long period of time, in fact, I want to explain manatees evolved with seagrass communities, so they depend on them. And actually, it's a very healthy symbiotic relationship. But when man gets involved and puts too much pollution in the water through the form of its wastewater from leaking septic tanks from improperly treated sewer water, if you will, runoff, which is contaminated with fertilizers and other pollutants, that actually gives a big shot to the algae. And there are different kinds of algae, but they get their food right directly from the water, the nitrogen and the phosphorus. They grow so prolifically that they shade off the light to the seagrass and the seagrass dies. And of course, the seagrass is that primary food of the manatee. So how are you and how are other biologists around the state what, what's the messaging? How do we reverse course here? How do we get that seagrass back? Uh, ex- explain on, uh, on that uh, end of the spectrum. Well, the sort of the good and the bad of it is we recognize what's wrong. And so we know what we need to fix. The bad is it's going to take a long time to do it, but that doesn't mean we don't get started right away. And it doesn't mean that actually efforts haven't already begun because, for example, in Brevard County, they passed a one cent sales tax that's going to help clean up the muck that's accumulated for years. They're putting it into other uh, restoration projects and things. So a lot more of that has to happen. We need to stop polluting and we need to clean up the mess that we created over decades of time. Is the Indian River Lagoon, is that the biggest problem area in the state of Florida currently? Presently, it is. It's 156 miles long. Uh, The area just east of Orlando, Brevard County, is a a long major county. That's where the the epicenter is of the problems, and it's worse. But throughout the Indian River Lagoon, there are problems with seagrass loss and, and repeated algal blooms. And in fact, other parts of Florida are experiencing the beginnings of these kinds of things. So we need to use the information we're gaining here to be more cautious about other parts of Florida as well. So your day to day, explain to me what do you respond to deaths? What what is your day to day uh, work so people know? So Save the Manatee Club is, for example, a a partner in the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership. That also includes the Fish and Wildlife Commission, Fish and Wildlife Service, our zoos and aquariums in Florida in particular, like SeaWorld, uh, Miami's Aquarium, Zoo Tampa, Jacksonville Zoo, and some other partners, and, and a research partner with the Clearwater Marine Aquarium. We are all working together to make sure that every a sick or injured manatee gets rescued and is rehabilitated, brought back to health, and then when it's safe, return to the wild. So that's one, and that's kind of the top priority. Yeah. Beyond that, we we'll work with the various agencies and partners to ensure that we get a better handle on what's happening with the water quality. So, for example, the St. John's Water Management District surveys for seagrass and, and where they are, how much there is, even monitoring for water pollution, if you will. Mm. The breakdown has been As Florida has been growing, we've been growing unsustainably. So we've been putting much more pollutions into the water than they can withstand. Mm -hmm. And that's why the algal blooms are happening. So it takes that whole groups together Mm -hmm. and people to step in and say, we aren't going to take this anymore. We want Florida to grow sustainably. We're not against growth and development, but we're against mortgaging our future for today for a 
short-term profits, and then we're going to have to pay for it by these kinds of collapses in our ecosystems. Manatees have had a rough go, and I know that a lot of work was done when it comes to boat strikes and preventing those and, and making the idle zones a certain length and everything like that. And that was, that was one facet of this. And I think people just said, okay, well, now we can, now the manatees are not uh, dying at the rate they were. Let's lift the endangered tag. Let's make them threatened. Now there's talk about bringing back the endangered tag. Can you explain to me the difference between the two and, and what you believe needs to happen? Well, it's an interesting situation. And clearly, the population of manatees from the time they were first listed in the late 60s up until when they were reclassified in, in 2017, mm -hmm. they had grown quite a lot. But really, I believe personally, having been at this for more than 45 years professionally and been a part of those recovery programs, we were really seeing the most improvements up through about 20, 2009 and 2010. Some of those problems were intensifying even further, and especially these kinds of issues with the aquatic ecosystem. So by the time they got around some six years later to look at reclassifying from endangered to threatened, we were already starting to see more severe problems. But they, the Fish and Wildlife Service responded to a lawsuit from the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a pretty anti-government group. They attacked the Endangered Species Act a lot. We feel they gave in and used really older data, didn't take into account the relative risks and threats today. And in fact, those warnings we gave them have now come true, sadly. We wish we were wrong, but we weren't. And so it is time to reconsider a reclassification back to endangered, but that's not the first and foremost thing to be done. We've got to work together to protect them, rescue those that are sick, provide for recovery of the seagrasses. And then we can look at, as there's time, what classification should, but action is what we need today. So in 45 years, I, I know that the headline that people have seen and is that there are the record number of deaths. In your 45 years, I mean, have you ever seen something like this, uh, 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 this situation getting to this level? We've had some very bad years before, none as bad as this, for example, but these other problems that created those records. So in 2010, we had a record cold mortality for manatees, very severe cold, more than 200 manatees dying from that. In 2013, we had an unusual mortality event in this same system, sort of a precursor of what we're experiencing today. In 2018, we experienced over 300 deaths from red tide. So, and then watercraft mortality, as much as the protections have been put in place and they work to the degree the boaters will abide by them, but we have seen a record number of manatees killed from 2016, 17, 18, and we, in, in 2020, we likely broke it, but we won't know because of COVID and the problems with keeping up with the necropsies. In 2021, we're seeing record watercraft mortality again at a pace. So not only now do our manatees suffering from this starvation event, especially in the winter, and that's when it's focused primarily, we're also seeing all these other factors increasing. And so again, it just points out how premature it was to reclassify manatees from endangered to threatened in 2017 when that happened. We'll have more from Patrick Rose coming up, including tips on how you can do your part in protecting Florida's manatee population. Stay with us. This is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Florida's manatees are dying at alarming rates. In fact, more have died this year than all of 2020. The primary driver, loads of nutrients affecting the water quality, resulting in the die-off of their main food source, seagrass. The executive director of Save the Manatee Club, Patrick Rose, is back with us now to break down what we can all do to protect these gentle giants. The worst case scenario has to be extinction. And, and it's hard to fathom uh, that an animal like the manatee that is so beloved here in the state of Florida and really across the country, they're gentle giants. They're, they are amazing to see in person. That's, that has to be a concern for you, is it? Well, it's, it is a, it's a major concern. But what people need to know is that can't happen without Florida almost being devastated because mm. the very things that manatees depend on for their survival are the things that our healthy aquatic ecosystems depend on. 
So you're if, if with manatee deaths and, and going further towards extinction, we're going to see massive seagrass kills. I mean, excuse me. Well, we will see that, but we'll see fish kills. We'll see the dolphins number depleting, the, the sea turtles, the other fisheries, those things that people come to Florida. We sometimes get 100 million visitors to Florida. If we lose the manatees, we will, that means those ecosystems will be so bad, degraded, that people won't want to come here or they won't want to live here. So we need to use this as the canary in the coal mines to wake up and understand that what's bad for manatees is bad for all of us. Yeah. And I, I, I imagine that manatees are not the only uh, species suffering currently with the seagrass loss, right? I mean, this is a, there's a serious trickle down, as you mentioned. Absolutely. The seagrass beds in our estuarine systems and our saltwater systems are really the basis of the food chain. So they're also the nursery grounds for all the larval fishes and and the crabs and all those different organisms that both we enjoy and appreciate, but also form the basis of all the recreational fishing and even commercial fishing. They need these nursery areas. And the productivity of those are directly dependent upon how well they can grow, receive light, the clear, clearer water. Mm-hmm. So there are, there are more problems than algal blooms. So that when we, we let runoff go into the systems, that carries the other turbidity with it because it's just really not been cleaned up, that can also shade out and slow the growth of seagrasses as well. So some of the, I mean, red tide, as you mentioned, that was, that was devastating. Um, seagrass, cold snaps because they go into cold shock. Right. And right. That's, that's why, you know, if, if folks are not familiar, if they just moved here, I mean, they, they move in serious migration to, different springs to get that warmer water, to find warmer water, especially in the cold months. Um, But it seems like, I I don't know if if there's one in particular that concerns you the most. Is it the seagrass and and the pollutants that are causing the algae blooms or causing the red tide? That's got to be the number one concern. The ones that can just explode are like this loss of seagrass in, in being so massive. We had 77,000 acres of seagrass within the Indian River Lagoon just back in 2010. We've lost about 95 to 96% of the coverage of seagrass or, or the biomass of seagrass. Now we're hoping there's about 40% of the area that still contains some seagrass, but sometimes only at one or 2%. So those could be the areas for it to regrow from. If we can get the water cleaned up and provide for that, we could get a recovery of that. And we hope that's a part of what's happening. We're looking at replanting together all the different partners, especially the Fish and Wildlife Commission. There was about an $8 million appropriation this year uh, that will help to provide manatees access to the springs and warm water habitat mm-hmm. together with replanting of seagrasses and, and those water quality issues. So we have some hope, but if the, we also lose our natural springs or so we over pump the aquifer, we know in the future that some of these power plants that manatees depend on, like the one in Brevard County that's centered around this issue, if those go away before we have a solution to what manatees are going to do, we could lose thousands there. So between the loss of forage and seagrass and the loss of warm water habitat, those are huge issues for the future. Today, we're battling every day to encourage boaters to slow down, pay attention to the signs. And as you know, most every living manatee today has scars from watercraft. So these animals are really facing it in so many different ways. But we, as the people who are causing it, but we are also the people that can get the word out, say the Manatee Club, for 40 years has been the voice for manatees. And we appreciate you giving us the opportunity to talk about that and ask others to join with that. I know that getting involved in, and following and just being aware of the situation is one way that people can help. But if there's uh, an actionable item that someone, maybe they don't even live on the coast and, and they want to do what they can, whether it's go out and and assist and volunteer or what they can do at home or what they can, how they can spread the message. I mean, what are some of the other tips that you can give folks to, to help out and, and to prevent something worse from happening? Well, something everybody can do is to urge their local state and U S representatives to take this issue seriously and get on board and say, we're, this is not acceptable. Mm-hmm. We need to both clean up the environment, the aquatic ecosystems and protect them but also protect the manatees specifically. Mm -hmm. And they can go to savethemanatee.org and we can guide them to how to actually reach their individual persons within the 
legislature or the or Congress, for example. And a number of those representatives are working on this issue. They're starting to take it seriously. I mean, what's more basic, frankly, than taking care of human waste as a part of infrastructure? So we're trying to encourage the president as well. I know they're in a big, you know, discussions with all that. But our water quality and aquatic ecosystems from human waste is pretty basic, as basic as a road or a bridge, for example. I mean, it's, it's been declining, obviously, uh, for a long time. Has it, is there anything that maybe exacerbated it or was it just reaching the tipping point? Well, it reached the tipping point, but it was exacerbated by that growth that's unsustainable. Mm. You, you, you give permits for things and putting places in places they shouldn't put them, for example. And then you assume the permits, the, the water quality monitoring uh, is not happening. So you not even have a good indication of how bad it is. They just assume the permits work the way they were written. And that's not true. Yeah. And in fact, we went through about eight years of our environmental protections for water quality and other standards being removed under one of our former governors, Governor Scott, I'll just say it. He's in, he's our senator today. He can step up and see, say, you know what? We made a mistake. We should have been more vigilant. And I would encourage him to do that and see him part of the solution too. So really there are ways that, that you, we just can't, as I said, mortgage our future for short-term cash today and for unsustainable growth. That's the long-term solution. But the short-term rescue, every sick and injured manatee folks can give to the Manatee Rescue and Rehabilitation Partnership through Save the Manatee Club. We're holding those monies. In fact, we're matching money for that to put more effort into this. They can support, of course, the education and outreach that we do at the club. Help us celebrate our 40th year in existence. We were formed in 1981 by Jimmy Buffett and Governor Graham, and they've been real warriors. And we just we would encourage others to come to our website and then learn more of what they can do more specifically. And again, that website is www.savethemanatee.org. My thanks to Patrick Rose for his time this week. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.